Myself. Yeah. Very good.
Good morning, everyone, and welcome to this session, uh, which is entitled Rehab, Shaping a More Effective Response to the Drug Trafficking Worldwide. My name is Mahmoud Mohamedou. I'm a professor of international history at the Graduate Institute in Geneva and a member of the West African Commission on Drugs, which was set up a few years back by the late Kofi Annan, whose memory we'd like to pay tribute to. Uh, we have a very distinguished panel this morning to help us discuss the questions uh, that are very much uh, on the agenda for us in the larger set of the issues that we'll be looking at, but specifically looking at this problem uh, because as issues have come to dominate the agenda as we've seen it uh, certainly over the past day, questions of migrations, questions of terrorism, questions of the environment, there's one issue that has been particularly remained on the agenda for several decades now, and it is the one of drugs. This is a complex issue. It has health aspects. It has policy aspects. It has political aspects. It even has racial aspects, which we'll come back to as well. But specifically, there is a central dimension, which is about the failure of the current state of affairs. If you look around, most people, most actors are not happy about the status of things at the global level, at the local level, in terms of the engagement of different actors, and in terms of what can be done about this. Year after year, the reports come in. There's a data issue, which is very important, that raises all manners of problems. Um, but the goals are not achieved. The objectives, diminishing, reducing, regulating in the proper manner, all of those not only do not work, but spell human rights violations increasingly. So how can the cycle be broken? How can we move forward? Which are the actors that should be brought onto this scene? To help us address these questions, we have you here, a distinguished panel, Mrs. Ruth Dreyfus, who's the chair of the Global Commission on Drug Policy. Welcome. Mrs. Marta Delgado, who's the Undersecretary for Multilateral Affairs and Human Rights in Mexico. Mr. Van de Mierik, who is the mayor of Ithaca in my home state of New York. Uh, Mr. Alexander Soros, who is the deputy chair of the Global Board of the Open Society Foundations. And Mrs. Golinda Carlson, who is the deputy executive of director of UNAIDS in Geneva. Welcome, all of you. Thank you for being us, with us here today. Let me start with you, uh, Mrs. Dreyfus. You've been conducting a lot of work on this. You served as president of Switzerland. You dealt with this issue in a variety of ways, at the community level, at the national level, of course. But in recent years, you've been engaged more on the global level of things, leading a number of initiatives. If we were to start this conversation really zooming out uh, onto the issues, when we look at the state of affairs, as I said, the policies are harmful and inefficient. So what is the fundamental problem that we're looking at when it comes to the drug problem? <clears throat> Merci beaucoup et merci à, à l'audience d'être là. Euh, merci au, au Forum de Paris pour la paix euh, de nous avoir euh, donné cette occasion. Euh, Permettez-moi juste une petite remarque. Nous sommes ici pour parler de paix. Et en même temps, nous parlons de guerre à la drogue. Or, cette notion même de guerre à la drogue, à mon avis, est une notion perverse et fausse. Parce qu'une guerre doit avoir un ennemi clair, elle doit avoir un objectif, il doit y avoir une paix possible. Or, ce n'est pas de cela qu'il s'agit quand on parle de guerre à la drogue. C'est une notion que nous avons héritée de messieurs Nixon et, et Reagan. Parce que qui est l'ennemi dans ce cas euh, Et comment, comment agir Et que sera la paix on, a par, on est parti de l'idée, et cela depuis plus de 60 ans, par des conventions internationales, par une collaboration qui s'est accrue et, je dirais, rigidifiée au cours des années, que la, la consommation de drogue était le mal. Et donc, il fallait empêcher la production, le, le commerce et la consommation. Et cela est euh, enraciné dans trois conventions internationales qui ont été très largement euh, ratifiées et qui ont influencé les législations nationales, en fait, de quasiment tous les pays. Voilà, voilà le fondement, voilà les, ra les racines. Et alors, les racines de quoi Les racines de la prohibition. Mm -hmm. Les racines d'une politique qui vise à éradiquer la production de drogue, à réduire euh, autant que faire se peut la consommation de drogue, et bien sûr à collaborer, en principe, contre ceux qui contreviennent à euh, ces... Ces objectifs. Donc on parle en fait d'une illusion, une société sans drogue. 
Ceci, c'est encore une fois le, le fondement. Mais quelles sont les conséquences Et c'est ce que vous demandez. Les conséquences sont en fait que euh, l'on a focalisé la question de la drogue sur l'aspect criminalité, ouais. au lieu de le concentrer non pas sur un seul aspect, mais de le lier aux questions de santé, de développement, de droits humains, de protection de la jeunesse, etc. etc. Et cette pensée en silo qui fait que on parle de crimes d'un côté et puis la santé, on en parle ailleurs dans la communauté internationale, à Genève par exemple, est aussi quelque chose qui a amené la communauté internationale à ce niveau d'impuissance où elle est aujourd'hui. J'aimerais très rapidement dire tout simplement que les conséquences, c'est une situation où la population carcérale a explosé, notamment à cause de la drogue où les maladies contagieuses ont été disséminées grâce, euh, si on peut dire, à l'injection de drogue et à la consommation de drogue, où, comme vous l'avez dit, des populations ont été encore plus marginalisées parce qu'elles ont été considérées liées euh, soit à la production, soit au trafic, euh, soit à la consommation de drogue. Donc, violation des droits de l'homme et impuissance, il nous faut changer de politique. Merci beaucoup. M Mrs. Carlson, um, Mrs. Dreyfus has pointed out to the fact that there is criminalization. This goes back to the founding problematic moment of the 1971 Nixon administration war on drugs, which has done all the harm that she points out. She indicates that there's a sense of confusion um, at the level of, of global sort of regulation, if at all there is. You mentioned the two conventions that are there, and there's a third also process that was started more recently. Um, in terms of incarcerations, um, out of the 10 million prisoners worldwide, one out of five has been incarcerated for dr a drug offense. So how can we break this cycle again, starting from this notion that sort of the legacy that we have had in terms of the policy is not only not helping, but it is problematic, And we now have a bit of a dead end internationally. And at UNAIDS, you've been working and leading on this. Could you tell us a little bit how this relates to what she was talking about? Thank you so much, Madhu. And thanks for Paris Peace Forum for having this opportunity also from a UNAIDS perspective right. to add on this complex issue, but also to come with some data and to discuss uh, what this war on drugs have created when we see also people who inject drugs and the likelihood to being incarcerated. For example, the likelihood for a woman who injects drugs are very likely that that is not only going to jail, but equally also more affected by also uh, becoming HIV infected. And that's why I think what What I would like to bring to the table here today is a little bit about the, the effects on this right. war that has been a total, in my mind, failure. But equally also to talk about the collateral damages that we have seen. And when we are doing that from UNAIDS, it's also to really work together with those communities affected mm -hmm. and to give voice to them and to tell that we are not only talking about this as a human rights issue, but equally also a health issue, where we see that the likelihood also when you're injecting drugs, not only to be criminalized, but equally also to become infected with, for example, HIV, and lack access to health and services, and of course, rights. Uh, and that's why I wanted to bring this to the table, because I think we also have to have some guilt on this, because there is a lot of harm and suffering that are not only about being seen as a criminal, mm -hmm. but equally also that you are risking your life. Mm -hmm. uh, and our work with the Commission on Drugs and together with President Dreyfus and others have been that we are bringing some figures here mm -hmm. around the likelihood of HIV, just to, to give you some perspectives here and to illustrate it with HIV. We see that we have had some decline in new infections in HIV globally, but among people who are injecting drugs, we don't. Mm. On, the, on the contrary, we actually see that in, uh, for example, Eastern Europe, people who inject drugs account for 41% of all the new infections and 37% in the Middle East and Northern Africa. So it's driving also HIV infections. And also that this is that we have more vulnerability mm -hmm 
also for young people who are injecting drugs to become HIV infected because they have not access to rights or to, human, to, to, to services. Uh, young people because it's not age sensitive, but equally also the likelihood for women that are injecting drugs, that they are in, in some parts of the world that I mentioned, that we can see that there are a, 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 a likelihood for, for many women to, to uh, be two out of five to, to have HIV AIDS when they are also uh, injecting drugs. Where do you so get the data from? So this data is what we at UNAIDS work with, right. because we see now that what we call key populations, mm -hmm. among them are people who are injecting drugs, mm -hmm. are really a majority now. It's also gay men and other men having sex with men and sex workers uh, and transgender people. But a majority of new infections today are actually in these key populations. So we have to address this also from a health issue. Uh, and that's why I think we are all together here today to discuss this and to have the perspective from communities, mm -hmm. but also this vulnerability for young people who are injecting drugs and equally also the vulnerability of women. Hold on to this health aspect because I think it's really the, the elephant in the room when it comes to this issue because the, the securitization approach, one could even say the militarization aspect in recent years, sort of launching a war on, as she was saying, is basically disappearing or invisibilizing or diminishing the importance of the central aspect, which is the implications on the health of these individuals, these youth, these women, uh, and such. But I wanted to go uh, to uh, Mexico and ask Mrs. Delgado, because you have a problem there, um, which is in many ways compounded in terms of the security aspect by the presence of an engagement on this front, which for many years has been quite um, intensive. Can you tell us a little bit how at the national level uh, these issues internationally or in terms of the research, how have you been dealing with them? Um, in Mexico, we have to face this as a terrible problem that is causing a lot of violence in the country. And uh, in the same time that we are facing this violence uh, because of the drug trafficking, the president has undertaken a new drug policy and we are drafting a new drug policy for the country. Uh, the new approach of the Mexican government includes to take into account that this is not just a... Um, uh, war against crime, but also a health problem, and mainly it is a regional problem that has to be uh, taken uh, as a holistic point of view. Mm -hmm. We need to uh, to establish transformative policies that must include the drug policy, of course, but also a uh, human rights approach, a gender uh, equity a approach, a social justice mm -hmm. approach, and uh, also has to do with environmental, territorial and planning uh, efforts of the Mexican communities in order to be developed and to uh, take the socioeconomic um, problem that we need to consider because the uh, Mexican situation in the current uh, moment is very difficult since the demand is not in our country. The demand is in the is United States and all the this violence is generated in communities that are looking for a better way of living. Yes, and I think this question of being a site of transfer, um, of transit, but also of consumption and production is something we saw in other parts. In the commission with Kofi Annan a few years back, we worked in West Africa and the classical perspective on West Africa is that it's a transit route onto Europe. Well, what the Commission found out is that this was actually compounded by the fact that you had episodes or experiences of local sort of short-term production cycles, and this is adding to the problem in terms of the roots and the, the political economy of it, uh, sort of. So. That, and that is linked also, not just uh, of that economy, but also with other crimes, right. because the drugs uh, traffic, it's mm -hmm. also linked with human traffic and other crimes related. Right. Uh, so the business is in there, mm -hmm. and the consumers are in another part. And we need a regional approach, not just from Mexico and the United States, even from Central America and Latin America, uh, as much as migration and climate needs a 
global approach, right. a multilateral approach, we also in this Great. matter we do need that. Thank you very much. Uh, Mrs. Mr. Mirik, um, Mrs. Delgado speaks about a holistic approach, uh, which is both conceptually building the different dimensions that have been mentioned, but also in terms of cooperation. Now, you as the mayor of Ithaca, you have launched something of a pioneering exercise in the United States, uh, a country uh, where the problem is obviously very well known for many, many years. We spoke about the 1970s and, and before that. Um, we, most of the news we have so far is, is not so good. And this is unfortunate. We have to be pragmatic. This is the reality of it. But in your neck of woods, it seems that you've made some, some progress and you, you led some very interesting efforts in collaboration with the Global Commission. Could you tell us a bit about that? Uh, sure. Uh, I mean, the top line, the headline here is that our plan, the Ithaca plan, has decreased fatal overdoses by 25% in the last two years. It's worked. And it's very progressive and it's very controversial, but we got there because our plan recognizes that Richard Nixon didn't launch a war on drugs. He launched a war on poor people, on black people, on brown people, and on cities. And understanding that helps us understand uh, how to fix it, how to actually solve it, right? If we believe that the intent of these policies is actually to help people who are using drugs get clean, people who might begin to use drugs stay sober, then we understand that, of course, these policies have been a failure, as you said. And I was a, uh, you know, any war, as President Dreyfus says, if they have enemies, mm. I was the enemy. <laughs> I was the casualty. Mm -hmm of this war because I was born in an inner city in 1987. This is in the um, peak of President Nixon's war on drugs. That meant that my father, who was in the Navy, he served our nation and began using drugs uh, in the Navy, was introduced to them and became uh, addicted to cocaine, crack cocaine, was in and out of jail some dozen times and was actually uh, in rehab at the time that I was born. So my mother, who got laid off from her job, had me in March of 1987, and we returned home to an eviction notice and lived the first six months of my life in a homeless shelter and the first eight years of my life in and out of homelessness. Now, I always believed, because of the way that I was raised, that this war on drugs wasn't about helping people but was about punishing certain people. But I never thought that I could be a part of changing it until I read the work that the Global Commission did. And I asked myself, is there any uh, way in which cities, municipalities at this point, so I got elected to the city council when I was 20, 24, I got elected mayor for the first time. I found myself in charge of a system, a small system at mm -hmm. that, but we had police and we have a jail. And I wondered, is there any way in which cities could help enact the findings of this Global Commission? How did you find out about them? Uh, I'm a very big um, nerd. I don't know how you say nerd in French, but nerd, uh, nerd <laughs> this is the same. Uh, uh, actually, it was in part through the Drug Policy Alliance, which yeah. is uh, supported in part by the Open Society Foundation and the Soros family, right. which I think is not said enough as one of the most important, prominent, and, and truly transformational families in our in our world. One of the best forces for, for good is the Soros family. That really is not said enough. And, uh, f and I say that because in part because I'm friends with Alex. <laughs> and so I have to. But before I was even friends with, no, before I was friends with Alex. A lot of Alex, people agree. He, you know, he and his family yeah. changed my life, yeah. saved my life yeah. before I even met them. And, uh, so when you connected with uh, Mrs. Dreyfus and uh, you visited as well, Ithaca, if I'm correct, this was, was, gave a bit of an imprimatur to what you were doing in terms of the legitimation of, on a global scale, right? 100%. When we came out with our plan, it was uh, global news. Right. Uh, many cities have now followed, but at the time when President Dreyfus visited, very controversial. Fox News was calling for my impeachment. <laughs> And I don't know if, if anybody here knows Ithaca, New York, but when Fox News wants you to be impeached, <laughs> it basically guarantees your re-election. And uh, uh, when, when my neighbors thought that I was out there, they thought I was crazy, this plan that includes safe injection, it could never work, 
the president of Switzerland came. <laughs> and she sat with my neighbors and she sat with the local media and she gave a speech and she went with me Good. to the areas that are most infected by this war on drugs and she gave so I just want to say right. I just want to say too that this you know uh, forums like this are incredible because they bring us together but the truth is that on the ground not much changes based right. on what happens here mm -hmm. but if folks of the gravity and influence uh, that we have on this stage, if they go into real communities, do the frontline work like President Dreyfus has done, uh, it, it makes an enormous okay. impact. And it's led to the, to the change, which sees that in my community, we have 25% fewer funerals mm -hmm. than, we, than we were having just two years ago. Well done, well done. Um, Mr. Soros, uh, the work that the foundation has been doing on this front has been mentioned. Um, and it partakes of a global set of activities that have to do with sort of norms, uh, transformation, um, global peace, as we've been discussing it here. But on this specific aspect, one of the um, sort of recurrent themes is that we're not able to get to humane policies. And so one of the discussions has been this notion of the harm aspect of this. And this is something that, that not doing harm, in effect, reducing it. And what what is the problem in terms of presenting this angle to policymakers? Where is the resistance when it would seem quite logical that moving to a, a health aspect, moving away from the conflict with the evidence that we've heard and with the sort of global perspective on this, that this would be kind of a, a logical avenue? Um, could you share with us your work on this and comment on those issues? Yeah, I mean, I... Um, sorry, yeah. So, um, you know... Um, I think that actually when it comes to resistance to harm reduction, uh, oftentimes you would be surprised at certain places where actually you are able to create openings because there is, in too many places in the world, uh, realizations by people in law enforcement, realizations by practitioners, realizations by mayors and leaders that this policy is not working, that just throwing people in prison, um, that just, um, you know, um, treating this as a purely, uh, as a purely, um, you know, uh, pure, pure issue of, you know, of, uh, of the police or of the military uh, does not work. Um, so um, harm reduction is, uh, or what we call harm reduction, is a beginning. Um, it, uh, you know, reduces uh, you know the harm that uh, that drug use has on the people consuming it, but also on the community um, at large. Um, you know, uh, President Dreyfus uh, helped, and uh, you know, has been a, a longtime hero of of, of mine for um, really um, you know going out and uh, inaugurating uh, in many ways this this uh, this approach um, by um, creating a safe place right. uh, for drug users to um, inject uh, intravenously um, and um, which had the effect uh, statistically right. uh, also because it provided, um, you know, which had, which had the effect uh, statistically of a 80% um, a drop in new drug use, a 50% drop in overdoses, uh, and a 65% decrease in the transmission of AIDS, uh, which is, you know, um, a public uh, health benefit to all citizens. Um, so um, when we look at this from a public health lens, and we let we let them the the you know uh, the you know the medical aspect and the public uh, the public health aspect speak. I think we're able to start a different type of a conversation. Right. Um, but you talked about uh, resistance, and I think that a lot of the resistance is stigma, and I think that. You know, and there was also, you know, mention of all the all the work and and that you know that that my family and the Open Society Foundation has done around this issue, and um, there is no personal story to it. Actually, um, there is no you know history of drug use in my family. There is no um, you know there is no history of, of alcoholism. Uh, it the doesn't real, have to be. No, no, but it, no. It's but, an issue that is arresting in and of itself. No, of course, but no, but this is the point. The point I'm going to get at because I because I don't think that people realize. I, I do believe that there's an explicit link, and this right. is why yes. we took this issue on between vulnerable populations and open society, which is that the the most open societies, the most tolerant democracies, and I think that you've you've seen this now uh, when it comes to refugees in certain countries. But I see. I think you also see when it comes to drug users are those where the most vulnerable are treated them are treated the most uh, the most humanely and too often 
those are the drug are people that are deemed you know the drug addicts and um, and and the users and you're seeing a war on them right. worldwide in the same time you're seeing a war on open society worldwide and that's why the link between these two issues is so cru I believe is so crucial for Very the work good. we do I want to I want to deepen that because I think this is a central issue and I think you you alluded to it Mrs. Dreyfus when you spoke earlier about this drift from the beginning from an approach that was not put on the right tracks and I think we've heard here something that is clearly dispossessive when it comes to specific communities at several layers whether it's an issue of gender whether it's an issue of youth whether it's an issue of race this is a big issue not only in the United States the African American the Latino issue has long been there but this is also global you see it in terms of poverty and in, in, uh, in Mexico you see it throughout Europe and other places and so is this something that is really at the heart of a misreading of the, the, the drugs problem, treating it, as Mr. Soros was indicating, as a, a way to close societies, in effect, and let these pockets away from the potential improvement through health, through research, through engagement by policymakers? Yes, uh, uh, je suis sûr que c'est vraiment de cela qu'il s'agit. Et j'aimerais dire que si nous voulons faire la paix de la drogue, enfin, et, et nous éloigner de la guerre contre la drogue, les, les recettes sont connues, les remèdes sont connus. D'abord, il faut associer tous ceux qui sont concernés par le problème de la drogue. Il faut associer les professionnels de la santé, de, de law and order, etc. Mais il faut aussi associer les personnes qui sont directement euh, touchées par, euh, par la drogue, les consommateurs, leurs familles, etc. Il faut créer un, une relation de confiance aussi. Euh, et, et pour cela, il faut pouvoir lutter contre les préjugés, contre euh, cette image diabolique que l'on met sur euh, la substance et ceux qui euh, la professent ou qui l'utilisent. D'un autre côté, il faut vraiment aussi voir tous les aspects en commun, j'entends, en mettant ensemble les différents stakeholders. Ça veut dire qu'on peut faire une politique cohérente en matière de santé, en matière de prévention, en matière de traitement, euh, en matière de droits humains, euh, dans la répression qui restera toujours une nécessité, dans la mesure même où on a abandonné au crime organisé, en fait, un marché extrêmement lucratif de l'ordre de, de 500 euh, milliards de, de dollars. Euh, on, a, on a laissé, au fond, se développer une économie extrêmement lucrative, mais également euh, violente. Et comme le disait madame aussi, une économie qui finalement se combine à toute une série d'autres activités criminelles. Donc ce qu'il faudra faire en fin de, en fin de course, c'est vraiment de reprendre le contrôle. De reprendre le contrôle, ça veut dire euh, non seulement d'abandonner les erreurs, d'abandonner euh, le, la négligence portée aux questions de santé, la négligence portée aux questions de, de la répression, d'une répression disproportionnée, c'est euh, euh, renoncer aussi à un contrôle tellement strict que des personnes dans le tiers-monde n'ont pas, pour l'essentiel, dans le, dans le sud, n'ont pas accès à des médicaments absolument essentiels, tout simplement parce que ces médicaments sont aussi sur la liste des drogues, la morphine par exemple, et que des personnes souffrent le martyr, tout simplement parce que la rigidité des contrôles fait que la plupart des pays euh, du Sud ne demandent pas de la morphine, n'importent pas de la morphine, les médecins n'osent pas prescrire de la morphine là où il y en a. Quelle serait la, la priorité en termes de changement de politique Alors, je dirais pour la vie des gens, c'est certainement ceci. Et là, il y a un consensus politique oui. sur le fait qu'il faut agir. Donc, agissons. Très bien. Pour moi, la priorité absolue, c'est de cesser de criminaliser les consommateurs de drogue. C'est à portée de main. C'est dans le cadre des conventions absolument possibles. Donc, cessons de punir des gens pour un comportement qui peut éventuellement leur nuire et qui ne nuit pas aux autres. Mais au bout du chemin, ce qui est nécessaire... C'est de reprendre le contrôle, c'est-à-dire de réguler mm -hmm. les marchés de la drogue entre des mains responsables, mm -hmm. ce qui n'est pas le cas aujourd'hui. Merci beaucoup. Uh, Mrs. Carlson, so taking back control of these things, regulating it, we've seen also, again, the news is not so bad. We heard the, the story from uh, New York, which I think is, is very inspiring. But many countries around the world are starting to approach this with a little bit more intelligence. There are a couple of countries that are lowering the punishment for drug use in Ghana, for instance, or reducing the harsh sanctions that were traditionally associated with that. Malaysia, away from the death penalty. 
introducing public health approaches in Sweden. Uh, you were a minister, you dealt with these issues yourselves. How can we relate these sort of islands of sort of moving forward in a more global, coordinated approach that would have at the heart sort of the decriminalizing that we spoke, so, uh, but also an efficient system which is missing and you work at the heart of this uh, in the UN system or with it. Um, how can we move forward? I mean, we are in a forum here where ideas are surfaced and, and, and current leaders and future leaders are listening. What, what are your thoughts in terms of connecting the dots on, on this front? So, and, and you linked it a little bit to my previous life coming from Sweden, where we actually were not so good on harm reduction. Uh, and the policies we are talking about here today, it is actually around harm reduction. It is about to make sure that we work with decriminalization, as you said, but also zero discrimination mm -hmm. against people that are injecting drugs. And, and when we are addressing this, I think it's very important to base it upon evidence, human rights, and use a health perspective. Uh, I am very inspired what you mentioned about Western and Central Africa, because they have dealt with this from a more reality problem with the trafficking of drugs and also how that affects their own communities and what can we do about it and realizing it's a complex issue and we need also the UN and the UN has recognized this and have good papers and working on this in another approach than perhaps my, my country done before and also the party I've served was not very uh, progressive on this. But what happened, for example, in a nation like Sweden was that the municipalities, that the mayor started to say, as it is a health issue, that Maybe we can't continue. So that's, so that's why I think it takes all of us to deal, deal it and also to see what open societies yeah. needs yeah. so that we have access to evidence mm -hmm. and an open discussion around it. But again, listening to the mayors, for sure, I think because you, but even though we were talking earlier, you have to, in, at least in your case, but certainly in Switzerland as well, in any federal system, you have to work with the state level, and then there's the national level, and then there's the existing regulations. Uh, but it seems that it's a lot about agency and sort of pushing that forward. Is this something, for instance, that in Mexico you had to, to, to experience as a difficulty. You spoke of a holistic approach. Did you have cases where, as we've seen in New York, there were success stories that could be replicated uh, beyond the Distrito Federal? Well, the, there are good experiences in some municipalities in Mexico, but now we are trying to change the approach from understanding the... Um, we need to raise a collaborative effort we need to stop the blaming of uh, this country or this community and pass uh, to another discussion. We, take, we need to take into account the educational, cultural phenomena that it is happening in each community in order for us to build up on a different uh, way to heal the uh, social fabric of each community right, right. in order to resist this, this other uh, trafficking or violence phenomena. And in Mexico, uh, as much as this uh, phenomena is linked with other crimes and with other deterioration of the, of the economical situation, it is very difficult to uh, start from education. Mm -hmm. So uh, regulation, uh, non-criminalization and a health approach and also uh, trying to be uh, very close to the families right. and to the young people. Svante, you, you mentioned earlier that the, um, the, what, you, what you started doing was controversial. How so? Yeah, sure. Um, uh, what we started doing was embracing fully this principle of harm reduction. And for those who are watching who don't know what harm reduction is, it's, it's this idea that if we can't stop someone from doing something that's dangerous, how do we make that dangerous activity less harmful to themselves and to the people around them? And this is actually, in most areas of government, uh, already well adopted, right? We know that we can't stop people from driving too fast in their cars, but we can install seatbelts. We can do some enforcement, right? We can give people tickets if they're driving too fast. We can install uh, um, 
uh, crash bags, airbags, mm -hmm. right? So that if you do crash, you're a little bit uh, more safely protected. This is not a controversial idea. It becomes controversial when it comes to drugs because, again, 40 years ago, conservative movements in the United States and across the world yeah. decided that criminalizing drugs was a good way to criminalize certain populations. You can make actual entire swaths of your population uh, into uh, criminals, where before maybe they would be considered dissidents, et cetera. So, yeah, I honestly think this is in part why cities are leading the way, and I think it's so important for mayors uh, and municipalities to be empowered because Donald Trump could never be elected mayor of any city in America, but he could get elected president. It's one person who agrees with me back there. Two, uh, two people. <laughs> but he could be elected president because at a national level, the social bonds become weak enough to the yep. point of breaking where you can get elected just by, as you said, scapegoating other people, yeah, yeah. saying the only problems in your life are caused by those people on the other side of this yeah. country. I can't get away with that yeah. because uh, when I get stopped in the grocery store, and believe me, as mayor, going to the grocery store is a nightmare. Uh, when I get stopped in the grocery store, people don't want to hear excuses. They don't want to hear that somebody on the other side of town is the reason why the potholes aren't filled and why the budget's not What balanced. do they ask you? They want results. They don't want excuses at all. They say, uh, people are dying in my neighborhood. How are you going to fix it? And if I say, well, the Republicans are the problem. It doesn't cut it. No, it doesn't cut it. And that's why, truly, truly, when you uh, press elected officials like that, like mayors are pressed, squeezed, and held accountable, you end up with results that actually work instead of results that just sound good in a commercial. I'm very happy you mentioned this sort of deeper political issue, and I wanted to go to you, Mr. Soros, because you, you mentioned it earlier in terms of connecting the social impact of the policies. But there's really at the heart of this a, a political decision by some around the world to basically have a sort of a drawing line where this part of the world, this part of the neighborhood, this part of the city, this part of humanity is going to be dealt with in that way. And then it piles up. And of course, the drug problem in and of itself, as we've seen, is a condition that has to be addressed. Um, but how, how do we bring this conversation away from the technicalities of, say, Task Force X at the UN working on it, which needs to do its work and it's moving forward and we've seen the results and there's a lot of professionals here engaged with that. But it needs to, this discussion needs to become more of an ethical discussion, doesn't it? I mean, I think, I think, it, you, know, I think you need to push on all, on all levers. Uh, you know, and I think one way of getting there is, you know, is through narratives and through stories, um, and Svante's story, which has been, you know, an, an inspiration to me of you know someone who grew up, um, you know, as a victim of the war on drugs and was able to miraculously uh, turn it around, um, so that, uh, you know, with a pledge, so that nobody else would have to endure what he had to endure is, you know, is a testament to that. Um, but I think that 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 that's important. I mean, hearing success stories and also giving a voice to those that have, you know, that have gone through the, the suffering and come out the other side so that you see that these are not people necessarily unlike, you know, unlike you. Um, but I think that, you know, one of the problems about the politics and the policies is that they make no sense. Mm. Um, you know, if, you know, even from a scientific, you know, or, or harm, you know, view of the punitive measures. I mean, everybody's talking about Nixon and war on drugs in 19, you know, in the, 19, in the early 1970s. The issue about the stigmatization of drugs in the U.S., which should have learned its lesson from prohibition, um, you know, which uh, you know, which didn't work and only and only just gave you know made the mafia more powerful um, and took money away from the U.S. government, um, it, you know, was was a complete was a stigma around the fact that marijuana and in, in our laws why that why marijuana was was you know uh, was made illegal in the U.S. was because it was a stigma that marijuana was used by African American jazz uh, performers and Mexican um, migrant workers, uh, and that stigma stayed into you know in um, stayed. Uh, into um, in, into lawmaking. Um, I mean, why crack cocaine, which you know, um, why smoking crack, you know, crack cocaine gets you a, a longer uh, sentence in prison than you know than taking um, than 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 taking you know the sub the substance of of coke when it's in powder form um, is completely because one you know is because one community is more susceptible to it and um, you know and has more of a say in the political system. I mean, you know. There's complete, you know, there's there's a completely racist element yep. in that, yep. um, in that, 
that uh, in that as well. Um, and a lot of these things are cultural, um, and that's why you know we oftentimes have a lot of you know debates, even among you know in the drug policy you know community about whether we should lead on marijuana because once you get you know once you get marijuana de you know de deregulated, um, we've seen in the U.S. that that can often you know broaden the scope. Um, but you know I don't think that that's going to work in certain places. That's not going to be it's not going to be the same thing in in places like you know like uh, you know Peru uh, you know or Bolivia where coca is right. endemic in the, in the national you know uh, population has been a crop there um, you know uh, for you know for um, you know for, for, for years and I think also paying attention to local conditions yeah. is is also you know very important there's not this there's no panacea yeah. to you know you know to this you know to this issue yeah. as you know as the great st statesman Chris Rock said you know human beings are always going to want to get high you know and we, we're just going to you know we have to accept that if we Chris Rock says it that's it yeah exactly <laughs> no of course I think you make an important point about the fact that it's no there's no panacea as you said this is a combination of things we started saying that it works at multiple levels and even when you go to sort of the inner city level and I mentioned Brazil because in a way it's a different urban setting than say North America but it is still an urban setting uh, as such or, or in this country here in, in the suburbs and in different places throughout Europe um, it always comes back to this notion of having to deal with it at, in a layered manner as opposed to kind of a, a one-dimensional all right, at this stage, I'd like to uh, open up the discussion, take some questions from the floor, and then I'll come back to you for final thoughts and comments. Uh, I'll take the lady right there. Uh, I think we have mics coming to you. Short questions. Thank short you very responses. much. Um, as a member also of the Global Commission and uh, on the Global Board of Open Society Foundations, uh, we are deeply uh, involved uh, uh, in these questions. And I, I just wanted to ask, here we are in France, a, an open society country, um, but with a problem uh, and not a solution. Right. And I just wondered uh, how you felt about uh, the question of open societies mm -hmm. that have a closed mind mm -hmm. in many ways and a history that they have difficulty undoing. How is, what would you say, what approach would be needed? Thank you, thank you for the, your excellent question. It's exactly what I meant to say earlier by sort of elevating this question away from the technical professional aspect, which is super important, and I think we said that, but it's not going to get to the resolving of these issues if that aspect is not addressed. But that's my response. Maybe we'll have another one. Um, I think, you know, yeah, I think Ruth had, a, had an experience yesterday visiting the National Assembly, and there's some, some, some pretty retrograde laws being introduced by uh, the French government today. La France a introduit il y a, il y a peu un plan contre la drogue, mais qui est un plan de répression. C'est un plan de meilleure coordination des services de l'État, de la douane, de la police, de l'armée, etc. Mais c'est un plan qui ne fait d'abord aucune hiérarchie entre ceux qui sont vraiment les responsables du crime organisé et ceux qui sont pris dans ce tourbillon, encore une fois, peut-être de petits deals, de consommation, de marginalisation dans les banlieues, etc. Et c'est une politique qui vise aussi, je dirais, à, à nettoyer certains quartiers et à en sacrifier d'autres. Euh, dans ce sens-là, je dirais qu'il y a là un, un, une erreur fondamentale, puisqu'elle ne fait justement pas le lien avec euh, le fait que cette criminalisation et cette répression va multiplier les obstacles à l'accès aux soins, à l'accès aux mesures de prévention des risques et que ce qu'il faut justement c'est encore une fois d'associer l'ensemble des personnes concernées et non pas de mettre l'accent uniquement et principalement sur, euh, sur la répression. Et je dirais que ce qui manque partout où cette discussion est si difficile, c'est les faits. C'est l'évidence, c'est la réalité d'abord qui nous enseigne beaucoup de choses. Nous avons appris justement une dure leçon à travers euh, ce qu'était l'épidémie du, du sida, ce qu'elle est encore, l'hépatite C, etc. Nous avons appris des leçons dures parce que nous avons ouvert les yeux. Et c'est ce qui manque actuellement, je dirais, dans, dans certains pays. Et parce qu'il y a des solutions. Alors, si vous me permettez juste d'ajouter quelque chose, parce qu'on a beaucoup parlé de, des différents niveaux de solutions et des difficultés, par exemple, que les maires ont de convaincre aussi, mais ils le font euh, admirablement, euh, comme nous l'avons vu, c'est qu'il y a une contradiction fondamentale à continuer à interdire la consommation de drogue 
et en même temps à essayer d'aider les consommateurs de drogue à survivre. Et c'est cette contradiction qu'il faut expliquer aux gens d'un côté, et on peut le faire quand on montre que ça sauve des vies, mais c'est une contradiction que les États et la communauté internationale doivent résoudre en changeant les lois. Parce que c'est elles, aujourd'hui, ces lois, qui euh, précipitent, je dirais, les populations et les responsables locaux et les professionnels dans cette contradiction. Et c'est dans ce sens-là, encore une fois, qu'il faut euh, montrer que les solutions pragmatiques, c'est bon. La contradiction dans laquelle euh, vivent les gens qui les appliquent, elle est bonne parce qu'elle sauve des vies, mais qu'il y a une responsabilité à faire la paix, encore une fois, en matière de drogue. Oui, c'est presque schizophrénique de continuer à pousser euh, sur cet aspect, alors qu'il euh, n'y a pas de, de preuve que c'est une solution. Sur le, le, le premier aspect de votre commentaire, suivant la question, on a beaucoup insisté sur les États-Unis, euh, mais en réalité, dans un pays comme la France, avec un travail euh, sur la mémoire coloniale qui n'a pas été accompli, ça rejoint aussi cette dimension sur laquelle nous avons des minorités, des individualités, des ethnicités, on va dire, euh, qui sont le plus souvent à the receiving end de, de cette, de cette euh, action étatique. Uh, je vous remercie. Uh, did you want to comment on this? Um... Well, I, I would only add that um, the burden of proof should be on the status quo, right? It should really... Uh, Explain that. The, the proponents of the war on drugs should have to defend their failures. Right. They should have to explain why in the U.S. we've spent one trillion dollars, locked up more people than any other nation in the world, and the overdose rate is only going up. They should have to explain why the status quo should be left in place. But that's not how it works in politics. It's not how it works in government. It's always the change makers, the reformers, that are called upon to prove that their reform will actually be effective. And uh, that's a risky proposition when you have to interview for your job every four years. And for us, you know, I was reading Ismail Millian's uh, writings about a triple latency in politics that is. Right. The, the time, the gap between when you propose something, when it takes effect, and when it actually has an effect. And uh, I just want to say, as a bit of advice to all elected officials, do something in your first term of office. Make that change because the first year of my second term is when we proposed this radical new drug policy. It was extremely controversial, but by the time I was running for re-election this year, the effects were already taking place. So it was on the street, everybody knew that people were healthier, there was less transmission of, of disease, people were staying alive longer, and in the first time in the United States when this radical drug, radical drug policy was on the ballot, we won re-election with 77% of the vote. Well done, congrats. Uh, questions? Uh, the gentleman over there, please. I'll take there. We have a mic. Yeah, go ahead, please. Oui, bonjour, je m'appelle Ibrahim Elani, je travaille sur les problématiques de développement en Afrique et je voudrais vous faire remarquer une chose qui me semble importante et capitale, c'est que quand on, on, on colle, quand on colle les deux cartes, la carte du terrorisme dans la bande sahélo-sahélienne et la bande, la carte de la drogue, ce sont des cartes similaires. Et ce phénomène, on le voit en Afrique, on voit bien que les réseaux qui travaillent sur les questions de drogue sont pour la déstructuration et pour, favorisent le phénomène de terrorisme. Dans ces... Mais c'est vrai en Afrique, mais c'est vrai aussi en Syrie, c'est vrai en Irak, c'est vrai. Et on voit une profusion de gens qui sont des acteurs de la drogue et qui amènent le terrorisme ou qui le favorisent. Et jusqu'à ce que les terroristes eux-mêmes ont besoin d'utiliser cette drogue pour se donner du courage ou de, une forme de surpuissance pour aller, aller, aller se faire tuer à cause de ça. Donc, Lutter contre les questions de drogue, c'est aussi impacter sur le, le développement et impacter sur la lutte contre le terrorisme à travers le monde. Merci beaucoup d'avoir souligné ce point très important. I'll take one or two more questions and then go back to the panel. The lady in green and the lady here, please. Short comments, please, because we're running out of time soon. 
Thank you so much for this panel and for your leadership. My name's Anne Fordham. I'm the executive director of the International Drug Policy Consortium, um, a global network of NGOs and civil society advocating for reform. And it's been really interesting to hear perspectives. I think um, it's really great to be here at the Peace Forum and to have this discussion in this open way. I think I would love to hear more about how we can continue to broaden out this debate because there are so many affected populations. You've talked a lot about the impact on people who use drugs. Um, also, there was a presentation here from another the project from coca farmers who are equally punished um, and suffer repressive measures that affect their basic um, survival needs from a development perspective that's incredibly problematic. I think drug policy um, discussions have enabled discussions about broader issues in society, about economic justice, about gender justice, about racial justice, and I would love to hear more about broadening out that discussion and, and how you think that's possible and the role of civil society also in that space. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ms. Fordham. These are very important aspects. We'll take them in a minute. And the last one here please. Thank you. My name is Suraya Aiti. I am from Aceh, Indonesia. Uh, when we talk about uh, the drug, I think it's uh, the global uh, epidemic, global problem, particularly is uh, when happen is uh, when the drug traffic is, for example, is my country, my region particularly, is as a transit from drug traffic from the China to Bangkok, Bangkok, Aceh, from Aceh to United States and others world. Uh, that is uh, the problem for us and uh, we do everything to stop this situation. However, it's not, not easy because it's the issue of global world and involved is uh, the world mafia. Uh, my question is how the world can do to stop this traffic because it's our country as a transit drug traffic is uh, we face the big problem, particularly is killing our future generation. Thank you very much. Very much. I'll take 30 seconds. The gentleman here, please quickly. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Merci, chers intervenants. Euh, Mohamed Levrak, je travaille sur euh, le dialogue interculturel et la paix. Rapidement, Monsieur le Président, quel remède apporter aux agriculteurs Je cite l'exemple, mais il n'est pas le seul de l'Afghanistan. Les agriculteurs se sont mis à cultiver du pavot à la place du mille, vu les prix exorbitants de l'un et pas de l'autre. Quel remède apporter à ces agriculteurs Merci. Merci beaucoup. Excellente question. Peut-être je vais commencer avec cette dernière. Euh, Madame Dreyfus, si vous voulez commenter là-dessus oui, je crois que les questions tournent tout autour, oui. en fait, des organisations criminelles et de leurs effets sur l'économie de la drogue. Euh, Quelqu'un disait il n'y a pas très longtemps euh, que les organisations criminelles respectent au moins une loi, la loi de l'offre et de la demande. En d'autres termes, euh, ce sont des business. Et lorsque monsieur dit d'ailleurs que euh, les trafiquants de drogue sont euh, les courriers de, de l'extrémisme, je crois que des études que vous avez faites d'ailleurs dans la commission ouest africaine montrent que ça n'est pas euh, si simple et que ça n'est pas vraiment le cas. Mais il y a des opportunités. Il y a des opportunités d'organisations criminelles qui, une fois, euh, peuvent euh, utiliser de la drogue, mais aussi euh, faire le transit de, de, de réfugiés, d'êtres humains, la prostitution, le trafic des armes, euh, etc. Donc, c'est une organisation. Il faudrait regrouper effectivement la lutte contre le crime organisé en n'isolant pas uniquement la question de la drogue et en collaborant entre tous les pays en suivant en fait ce qui fait justement l'intérêt de l'offre et de la demande, c'est-à-dire l'argent. C'est la lutte contre la corruption, c'est la lutte contre euh, le blanchiment d'argent qui doit mobiliser effectivement la communauté internationale pour que cette lutte-là contre effectivement ceux qui profitent de la misère des paysans, euh, ceux qui profitent enfin de la faiblesse des structures pour faire passer leurs marchandises, etc., puissent effectivement être mis hors la loi. Encore une fois, quand on parle de drogue, on ne parle pas, on, est, on, évite, on évitera pas la répression. Mais il faut savoir qui on veut réprimer. Certainement pas les consommateurs de drogue, certainement pas les personnes que la misère pousse à des activités au bas de la pyramide, mais ceux qui sont responsables, encore une fois, du crime organisé sous toutes ses formes follow the money as much as follow the drugs, if not more. Uh, you have had this, the issue that was raised, the terrorism issue in the Levant, in the Sahel, 
it's also quite visible in places like Ciudad Juarez, for instance, where there's a sort of overlapping of things. Uh, does this issue um, resonate with you? Yes, of course. And also the fact that the uh, weapons traffic and the violence linked to that traffic. It is uh, also another schizophrenic thing. The drugs are illegal, uh, drug addiction is illegal, but for example, in the United States, you can uh, buy weapons uh, in a legally manner, and that are trafficked to Mexico, and uh, that is the instrument to create fear and to be used uh, by the all the the criminal cartels so uh, the fact that this is also not linked to the policy of drugs it is difficult we uh, for example at the international level we are uh, uh, pursuing the non-proliferation of nuclear weapons and the prohibition of nuclear weapons uh, and at the same time Mexico is also pursuing to uh, collaborate with other countries in order to control the arms of weapons traffic and the, the lighter uh, weapons traffic. Very good. Um, Gunilla, Anne's question um, raises the question of, of who's missing as actors. Uh, um, I mean, we spoke at different layers, as she pointed out, but back now to the professional realm of things and the initiatives that are working and what you're doing there. Um, are there actors that are left behind that we should bring that would give us a bit more efficiency in this process or that are simply legitimately have to be present? I think what we're doing here today is uh, looking into who is affected and what will this mean for the communities and how can we give that space to also see how we can change the logic, the information and the understanding of driving reforms that are helping humanity to overcome a very complex issue that has so many layers and so many trying to, solu to, to have solutions, but status quo will not help us. Mm. We see now from a health perspective that this is really now hampering the, 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 the decrease we have seen in HIV new infections, but on the contrary in some closed societies and where people are not having access to rights uh, or health or giving a space in society, yeah. we see that we have a decrease increase in new HIV infection and many times around people who are, for example, using drugs. So if we can give space for them and to have this opportunity to look into it from a health and human rights aspect and not only for big state perspectives on security, because actually now we're not only having a health problem on this war on, on drugs, we're also increasingly having in our society violence and increase in security when it comes to lives. Very good. Uh, on this, I just uh, you want to make, make a couple of points on, on on these issues. I mean, I think you know we have to look at the uh, you know at the demand side. I mean, and you know I think that you know the the one thing that we can say is that we should you know in in answer to these you know to the questions about drug smugglers and and organized crimes, let's put let's put them out of business, um, you know, and um, you know, and the issue of you know of, of keeping this idea you know of prohibition and you know arcane drug laws and keeping these you know organized crime in business because there is a demand um, is the problem so um, you know you know effective ways of of decriminalizing um, small amounts of drug use um, you know as they've done in, in in Portugal and as they they may be doing in the state of Oregon are ways of are ways of uh, combating this but I think that there's you know there's another layer of, of issues we're talking a lot about human rights but but um, you know but um, bad drug policies and especially dealing with you know um, uh, changing of, of crops like uh, like coca and um, you know and also um, like poppy seeds have an effect on the environment. I mean, in Latin America, um, you know um, you know crop replacement is basically just deforestation uh, by by a different name. And you know, given uh, given the issues surrounding the environment now, I think that the the nexus of bad uh, bad drug policies and environmental degradation has to be uh, has to be lifted up more um, in the way that, it, that in the way that it uh, affects us all. Thank you for raising that. We have about one minute left in the final uh, seconds of this. Uh, thank you, you've raised a lot. Um, I'd like us to, to turn a little bit to the future, taking my cue from you on peace. In five seconds, ten seconds each, what would a world after the war on drugs look like? A peace-looking world that would have 
made this war on drug obsolete if we ever get there, but we have to be optimistic and we have to be also sort of very much um, tackling that issue. What it would look like? I'll say a word for uh, what Alex said, which is decreasing demand. We, ask, we have to ask ourselves, why are people using painkillers? It's because they're in pain. So if we can address childhood trauma, if we could provide healthier alternatives to using drugs, uh, if we can treat people, both for their mental and physical health, we'll be better off. What would a world beyond the war on drugs look like? People will live longer, they'll have happier lives, they'll have healthier lives, and families will, will, uh, will be more... Families will have the chance that my mother ultimately and my grandfather and grandmother ultimately gave my family, which was a chance to stay together, to thrive, and to be successful. Thank you. Stelgado? We have a uh, international agreement on the 2030 agenda, and I think that we can apply on each of the 17 objectives a dimension uh, to, uh, to address the drugs problem and, the, and violence. And uh, that would be uh, a good uh, frame time in order to achieve a peace and also a, a, a world that uh, take uh, responsibility on the drugs fight. Good. Sir? You know, look, it's, uh, I, yep. if the war on drugs dies, you know, dies tomorrow, things will, be, things will be better. Things will be better for the majority, uh, majority of people in society. Things will be better for society as a whole. There will still be issues to deal with. You know, I don't think any, you know, nobody, I don't think, signs up to become a drug addict. Um, there will, you know, it's not a panacea. Um, these are still issues. Um, you know, ending the drug war is just, is just, uh, is just, uh, is just one of the issues. But I can certainly say that a lot of pain, suffering, and wasted lives would not, um, would not, would, we would not be having to discuss right now. Thank you. Vanilla? So, and in my perspective, we would see what we can could vulnerable populations have access to health and rights and also not being discriminated against. A tout seigneur, tout honneur. Je crois que ce que serait un monde le jour où on aura obtenu ce que l'on veut, c'est-à-dire la fin de la prohibition, c'est un monde dans lequel les, les États, les politiciens prennent la responsabilité de la santé de leur population sans interférer dans leur vie privée et dans leurs choix personnels. C'est-à-dire une société ouverte, justement, qui respecte les gens, qui rétablit une confiance entre les autorités et les populations qui, aujourd'hui, ont toutes les raisons de ne pas faire confiance parce qu'elles sont, en fait, marginalisées et, et réprimées. Et c'est donc une société où on prendrait des responsabilités en disant... Il y a des substances qui sont dangereuses, il y a des comportements qui sont dangereux, mais notre rôle n'est pas de les interdire. Notre rôle est d'informer la population, de faire de la pré prévention et notre rôle est aussi d'éviter que les personnes prennent des risques inconsidérés, en particulier la jeunesse, prennent des risques inconsidérés parce que nous sommes responsables aussi euh, de leur vie. Nous ne sommes pas responsables de leur morale individuelle ou des choix qu'ils font de consommation, mais nous sommes responsables de leur chance d'être éduqués, d'être bien informés, de faire des choix éclairés et finalement aussi euh, de fabriquer leur propre bonheur sans que l'État décide pour eux ce qu'ils doivent faire. Merci. Please join me in thanking our speakers.